Chapter Seven of The Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague: A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter Seven. The wanderer, when Keyork Arabian had left him, had intended to revisit Unorna without delay but he had not proceeded far in the direction of her house when he turned out of his way and entered a deserted street which led towards the river he walked slowly drawing his furs closely about him for it was very cold he found himself in one of those moments of life in which the presentiment of evil almost paralyzes the mind's power of making any decision in general a presentiment is but a result upon the consciousness of conscious or unconscious fear this fear is very often the natural consequence of the reaction which in melancholy natures comes almost inevitably after a sudden and unexpected satisfaction or after a period in which the hopes of the individual have been momentarily raised by some unforeseen circumstance it is by no means certain that hope is of itself a good thing the wise and mournful soul prefers the blessedness of that non expectancy which shall not be disappointed to the exhilarating pleasures of an anticipation which may prove empty in this matter lies one of the great differences between the normal moral state of the heathen and that of the christian the greek hoped for all things in this world and for nothing in the next the christian on the contrary looks for a happiness to come hereafter while fundamentally denying the reality of any earthly joy whatsoever in the present man however is so constituted as to find it almost impossible to put faith in either bliss alone without helping his belief by borrowing some little refreshment from the hope of the other the wisest of the greeks believe the soul to be immortal the sternest of the christians cannot forget that once or twice in his life he had been contemptibly happy and condemns himself for secretly wishing that he might be as happy again before it's all over faith is the evidence of things unseen but hope is the unreasoning belief that unseen things may soon become evident the definition of faith puts earthly disappointment out of the question that of hope introduces into human affairs as a constant and imminent probability the development of psychologic search in our day has proved beyond a doubt that individuals of a certain disposition may be conscious of events that are actually occurring or which have recently occurred at a great distance but it has not shown satisfactorily that things yet to happen are foreshadowed by that restless condition of the sensibilities which we call presentiment we may and perhaps must admit that all is or has been produces a real perceptible impression upon all else that is but there is as yet no good reason for believing that an impression of what shall be can be conveyed by anticipation without reasoning to the mind of man but though the realization of a presentiment may be as doubtful as any event depending upon chance alone yet the immense influence which a mere presentiment may exercise is too well known to be denied the human intelligence has a strong tendency to believe in its own reasoning of which indeed the results are often more accurate and reliable than those reached by the physical perceptions alone the problems which can be correctly solved by inspection are few indeed compared with those which fall within the province of logic man trusts to his reason and then often confounds the impressions produced by his passions with the results gained by semi-conscious deduction his love his hate his anger creates fears and these supply him with presentiments which he is inclined to accept as so many well-reasoned grounds of action if he is often deceived he becomes aware of his mistake and going to the other extreme considers a presentiment as a sort of warning that the contrary of what he expects will take place if he chances to be often right he grows superstitious the lonely man who was pacing the icy pavement of the deserted street on that bitter winter's day 
felt the difficulty very keenly. He would not yield, and he could not advance. His heart was filled with forebodings, which his wisdom bade him treat with indifference, while his passion gave them new weight and new horror with every minute that passed. He had seen with his eyes and heard with his ears. Beatrice had been before him, and her voice had reached him among the voices of thousands. But now, since the hours had passed, he had not found her. It was as though he had been near her in a dream, and the strong certainty took hold of him that she was dead, that he had looked upon her wraith in the shadowy church. He was a strong man, not accustomed to distrust his senses, and his reason opposed itself instantly to the suggestion of the supernatural. He had many times, on entering a new city, felt himself suddenly elated by the irresistible belief that his search was at an end, and that within a few hours he must inevitably find her, whom he had sought so long. Often as he passed through the gates of some vast burying place, he had almost hesitated to walk through the silent ways, feeling all at once convinced that upon the very first headstone he was about to see the name that was ever in his heart. But the expectation of final defeat, like the anticipation of final success, had always been deceived. Neither living nor dead had he found her. Two common reasonable possibilities lay before him, and two only. He had either seen Beatrice or he had not. If she had really been in the Teyen Kirche, she was in the city and not far from him. If she had not been there, he had been deceived by an accidental but extraordinary light. With the logical concatenation of cause and effect, there was no room for any other supposition, and it followed that his course was perfectly clear. He must continue his search until he should find the person he had seen, and the result would be conclusive, for he would again see the same face and hear the same voice. Reason told him that he had in all likelihood been mistaken after all. Reason reminded him that the church had been dark, the multitude of worshippers closely crowded together, the voices that sang almost innumerable and wholly undistinguishable from each other. Reason showed him a throng of possibilities, all pointing to an error of his perceptions, and all in direct contradiction with the one fact which his loving instinct held for true. The fear of evil, the presentiment of death, defied logic and put its own construction and interpretation upon the strange event. He neither believed nor desired to believe in a supernatural visitation, yet the inexplicable certainty of having seen a ghostly vision overwhelmed reason and all her arguments. Beatrice was dead. Her spirit had passed in that solemn hour when the wanderer had stood in the dusky church. He had looked upon her shadowy wraith and had heard the echo of a voice from beyond the stars, whose crystal tones already swelled the divine harmony of an angelic strain. The impression was so strong at first as to be put but one step removed from conviction. The shadow of a great mourning fell upon him, of grief too terrible for words, too solemn for tears, too strong to find any expression save in death itself. He walked heavily, bending his head, his eyes half closed, as though in bodily pain. The icy pavement rang like iron under his tread. The frozen air pierced through him as his sorrow pierced his heart. The gloom of the fast-sinking winter's day deepened as the darkness in his own soul. He, who was always alone, knew at last what loneliness could mean. For she had lived, she had been with him always, a living, breathing woman, visible to his inner eyes, speaking to his inward hearing, waking his sleepless love. He had sought her with a restless haste and untiring strength through the length and breadth of the whole world, but yet she had never left him. He had never been separated from her for one moment, never, in the years of his wandering, had he entered the temple of his heart without finding her in its most holy place. Men told him that she was dead, but he had looked within himself and seen that she was still alive the dread of reading her sacred name carved upon the stone that covered her resting place had chilled him and made his sight tremble but he had entered the shrine of his soul and had found her again untouched by death 
unchanged by years living loved and loving but now when he shut out the dismal street from view and went to the sanctuary and kneeled upon the threshold he saw but a dim vision as of something lying upon the altar in the dark something shrouded in white something shapely yet shapeless something that had been and was not any more he reached the end of the street but he felt a reluctance to leave it and turned back again walking still more slowly and heavily than before so far as any outward object or circumstance could be said to be in harmony with his mood the dismal lane the failing light the bitter air were at that moment sympathetic to him the tomb itself is not more sepulchral than certain streets and places in prague on a dark winter's afternoon in the certainty that the last and the greatest of misfortunes had befallen him the wanderer turned back into the gloomy byway as the pale wreathing ghosts fearful of the sharp daylight and the distant voices of men sink back at dawn into the graves out of which they have slowly risen to the outer air in the silence of the night death the arch steward of eternity walks the bounds of man's entailed estate and the headstones of men's graves are landmarks in the great possession committed to his stewardship enclosing within their narrow ring the wretched plot of land which makes up all of life's inheritance from ever to always the generations of men do bondsmen's service in that single field plough it and sow it and harrow it and water it to lay the sickle to the ripe corn if so be that their serfdom falls in the years of plenty and the ear is full to eat the bread of tears if their season of servitude be required of them in a time of scarcity and famine bondsmen of death from birth they are sent forth out of the sublime silence of the pathless forest which hems in the open globe land of the present and which is eternity past and to come bondsmen of death from youth to age they join in the labour of the field they plough they sow they reap perhaps tears they shed many and of laughter there is also a little amongst them bondsmen of death to the last they are taken in the end when they have served their tale of years many or few and they are led from furrow and grassland willing or unwilling mercifully or cruelly to the utmost boundary and they are thrust out quickly into the darkness whence they came for their place is already filled and the new husbandmen their children have in their turn come into the field to eat of the fruit they sowed to sow in turn a seed of which they themselves shall not see the harvest whose sheaves others shall bind whose ears others shall thresh and of whose corn others shall make bread after with our eyes we may yet see the graves of two hundred generations of men whose tombs serve but to mark that boundary more clearly whose fierce warfare when they fought against the master could not drive back that limit by a hand breadth whose uncomplaining labour when they accepted their lot patiently earned them not one scant foot of soil wherewith to broaden their inheritance as a reward for their submission and of them all neither man nor woman was ever forgotten in the day of reckoning nor was one suffered to linger in the light death will bury a thousand generations more in graves as deep strengthening year by year the strong chain of his grim landmarks he will remember us every one when the time comes to some of us he will vouchsafe a peaceful end but some shall pass away in mortal agony and some shall be dragged unconscious to the other side but all must go some shall not see him till he is at hand and some shall dream of him in a year long dreams of horror to be taken unawares at the last he will remember us every one and will come to us and the place of our rest shall be marked for centuries for years or for seconds for each a stone or a few green sods laid upon a mound beneath the sky or the ripple on a changing wave when the loaded sack has slipped from the smooth plank and the sound of a dull splash has died away in the wind there be strong men as well as weak who shudder and grow cold when they think of that yet undated day which must close with its black letter their calendar of joy and sorrow there are weaklings as well as giants who fear death for those they love 
but who fear not anything else at all the master treats courage and cowardice alike achilles and thersites must alike perish and none will be so bold as to say that he can tell the dust of the mishappen varlet from the ashes of the swift-footed destroyer whose hair was once so bright whose eyes were so fierce whose mighty heart was so slothless so wrathful so inexorable and so brave the wanderer was one of those who dread nothing save for the one dearly beloved object but who when that fear of once aroused by a real or an imaginary danger can suffer in one short moment the agony which should be distributed through a whole lifetime the magnitude of his passion could lend to the least thought or presentiment connected with it the force of a fact and the overwhelming weight of a real calamity in order to feel any great or noble passion a man must have an imagination both great and sensitive in at least one direction the execution of a rare melody demands as a prime condition an instrument of wide compass and delicate construction and one of even more rich and varied capabilities is needed to render those grand harmonies which are woven in the modulation of sonorous chords a skilful hand may draw a scale from wooden blocks set upon ropes of straw but the great musician must hold the violin must feel the keys of the organ under his fingers and the responsive pedals at his feet before he can expect to interpret fittingly the immortal thought of the composer the strings must vibrate in perfect tune the priceless wood must be seasoned and penetrated with the melodies of years and scores of years the latent music must be already trembling to be free before the hand that draws the bow can command the ears and hearts of those who hear so too love the chief musician of this world must find an instrument worthy of his touch before he can show all his power and make heart and soul ring with the lofty strains of a sublime passion not everyone knows what love means few indeed know all that love can mean there is no more equality among men than there is likeness between them and no two are alike the many have little the few have much to the many is given the faint perception of higher things which is either the vestige or the promise of a nobler development past or yet to come as through a veil they see the line of beauty which is not theirs to trace as in a dream they hear the succession of sweet tones which they themselves never bring together though their half-grown instinct feels a vague satisfaction in the sequence as from another world they listen to the poet's song wondering admiring but powerless over the great instrument of human speech from whose fifteen thousand keys their touch can draw but the dull tuneless prose of daily question and answer as in a mirage of things unreal they see the great deeds that are done in their time for love or hate for race or country for ambition and for vengeance but though they see the result and know that the motive the inward meaning and spirit of it all escapes them it is theirs to be and existence is in itself their all to think to create to act to feel can only be for the few to one is given the transcendent genius that turns the very stones along life's road to precious gems of thought whose gift it is to find speech in dumb things and eloquence in the ideal half of the living world to whom sorrow is a melody and joy sweet music to whom the humblest effort of a humble life can furnish an immortal lyric and in whom one thought of the divine can inspire a sublime hymn another stoops and takes a handful of clay from the earth and with the pressure of his fingers moulds it into the reality of an unreal image seen in dreams or standing before the vast rough block of marble he sees within the mass the perfection of a faultless form he lays the chisel to the stone the mallet strikes the steel one by one the shapeless fragments fly from the shapely limbs the matchless curves are uncovered the breathing mouth smiles through the petrification of a thousand ages the shroud of stone falls from the godlike brow and the hermes of olympia stands forth in all his deathless beauty 
another is born to the heritage of this world's power foredestined to rule and fated to destroy the naked sword of destiny lies in his cradle the axe of a king-maker awaits the awakening of his strength the sceptre of supreme empire hangs within his reach unknown he dreams and broods over the future unheeded he begins to move among his fellows a smile half of encouragement half of indifference greets his first effort he advances a little further and thoughtful men look grave another step and suddenly all mankind cries out and faces him and would beat him back but it is too late one struggle more and the hush of a great and unknown fear falls on the wrangling nations they are silent and the world is his he is the man who already thinking when others have scarcely begun to feel who is creating before the thoughts of his rivals have reached any conclusion who acts suddenly terribly and irresistibly before their creations have received life and yet the greatest and the richest inheritance of all is not his for it has fallen to another to the man of heart and it is the inheritance of the kingdom of love in all ages the reason of the world has been at the mercy of brute force the reign of law has never had more than a passing reality and never can have more than that so long as man is human the individual intellect and the aggregate intelligence of nations and races have alike perished in the struggles of mankind to revive again indeed but as surely to be again put to the edge of the sword here and there great thoughts and great masterpieces have survived the martyrdom of a thinker the extinction of a school the death of a poet the wreck of a high civilization socrates is murdered with the creed of immortality on his very lips hardly had he spoken the wonderful words recorded in the phaedo when the fatal poison sent its deathly chill through his limbs the greeks are gone yet the hermes of olympia remains mutilated and maimed indeed but faultless still and still supreme the very name of homer is grown well nigh as mythic as his blindness there are those today who standing by the grave of william shakespeare say boldly that he was not the creator of the works that bear his name and still through the centuries achilles wanders lonely by the shore of the sounding sea paris loves and helen is false ajax raves and odysseus steers his sinking ship through the raging storm still hamlet the avenger swears hesitates kills at last and then himself is slain romeo sighs in the ivory moonlight and love-bound juliet hears a triumphant lark carolling his ringing hymn high in the cool morning air and says it is the nightingale the mortals all the marble god the greek the dane the lovesick boy the maiden foredoomed to death but how short is the roll call of these deathless ones through what raging floods of destruction have they lived through what tempests have they been tossed upon what inhospitable shores have they been cast up by the changing tides of time since they were called to life by the great half nameless departed how often has their very existence been forgotten by all but a score of tens of millions has it been given to those embodied thoughts of transcendent genius to ride in the whirlwind of man's passions or to direct the stormy warfare of half frantic nations since they were born in all their bright perfection to live on in unchanging beauty violence has ruled the world many a time since then the sword has mown down its harvest of thinkers many a time has the iron harrow of war torn up and scarred the face of the earth athens still stands in broken loveliness and the tiber still rolls away its tawny waters heavily through rome but rome and athens are today but places of departed spirits they are no longer the seats of life their broken hearts are petrified all men may see the ports through which the blood flowed to the throbbing centre the traces of the mighty arteries through which it was driven to the ends of the earth but the blood is dried up the hearts are broken and though in their story ruins those dead world hearts would be grander and more enduring than any which in our time are wholly beating 
but yet neither their endurance nor their grandeur have saved them from man the destroyer nor was the beauty of their thoughts or the thoughtfully devised machinery of their civilization a shield against a few score thousand rough hammered blades wielded by rough-hewn mortals who reck neither of intellect nor of civilization and we yet of beauty but being very human men full of terribly strong and human passions look where you will throughout the length and breadth of all that was the world five thousand or five hundred years ago everywhere passion has swept through it before and belief reason and we too with our reason and our thoughts shall be swept from existence and the memory of it is this the age of reason and is this the reign of law in the midst of this civilization of ours three millions of men lay down nightly by their arms men trained to handle rifle and sword taught to destroy and do nothing else and nearly as many more wait but a summons to leave their homes and join the ranks it is often said that we are on the eve of a universal war at the command of a few individuals at the touch of a few wires more than five millions of men in the very prime and glory of strength armed as men never were armed since time began will arise and kill civilization and thought as both the one and the other have been slain before by fewer hands and less deadly weapons is this the reason or is this the law passion rules the world and rules alone and passion is neither of the head nor of the hand but of the heart passion cares nothing for the mind love hate ambition anger avarice either make a slave of intelligence to serve their impulses or break down its important opposition with the unanswerable arguments of brute force and tear it to pieces with iron hands love is the first the greatest the gentlest the most cruel the most irresistible of passions in his least form he is mighty a little love has destroyed many a great friendship the merest outward semblance of love has made such havoc as no intellect could repair the reality has made heroes and martyrs traitors and murderers whose names will not be forgotten for glory or for shame helen is not the only woman whose smile has kindled the beacon of a ten years war nor antony the only man who has lost the world for a caress it may be that the helen who shall work our destination is even now twisting and braiding her golden hair it may be that the new antony who is to lose this same old world again already stands upon the steps of cleopatra's throne love's day is not over yet nor has man outgrown the love of a woman but the power to love greatly is a gift differing much in kind though little in degree from the inspiration of the poet the genius of the artist or the unerring instinct and eagle's glance of the conqueror for conqueror artist and poet are moved by passion and not by reason which is but their servant in so far as it can be commanded to move others and their deadliest enemy when it would move themselves let the passion and the instrument but meet being suited to each other and all else must go down before them few indeed are they to whom it is given that rich inheritance and they themselves alone know all their wealth and all their misery all the boundless possibilities of happiness that are theirs and all the dangers and terrors that beset their path he who has won woman in the face of daring rivals of enormous odds of gigantic obstacles knows what love means he who has lost her having loved her alone has measured with his own soul the bitterness of earthly sorrow the depth of total loneliness the breadth of the wildness of despair and he who has sorrowed long who has long been alone but who has watched the small twinkling ray still burning upon the distant border of his desert the faint glimmer of a single star that was still above the horizon of despair he can only tell what utter darkness can be upon the face of the earth when that last star has set for ever with it are gone suddenly the very quarters and cardinal points of life's chart there is no longer any right hand or any left or north or south 
any rising of the sun or any going down any forward or backward direction in his path any heaven above or any hell below the world has stood still and there is no life in the thick black stillness death himself is dead and one living man is forgotten behind to mourn him as a lost friend pray that some new destroyer more sure of hand than death himself may come striding through the awful silence to make an end at last to the tormented spirit to bear it swiftly to the place where the last star ceased to shine and to let it down into the restful depths of an unremembering eternity but into that place which is the soul of man no destroyer can penetrate that solitary life neither the sword nor pestilence nor age nor eternity can extinguish the immortal memory no night can obscure there was a beginning indeed but end there can be none such a man was the wanderer as he paced the deserted street in the cool gloomy cold of the late day between his sight and the star of his own hope an impenetrable shadow had arisen so that he saw it no more the memory of beatrice was more than ever distinct to his inner sense but the sudden presentiment of her death real in its working as any certainty had taken the reality of her from the ground on which he stood for that one link had still been between them somewhere near or far during all these years she too had trodden the earth with her light footsteps the same universal mother earth on which they both moved and lived the very world was hers since she was touching it and to touch it in his turn was to feel her presence for who could tell what hidden currents ran in the secret depths or what mysterious interchange of sympathy might not be maintained through them the air itself was hers since she was somewhere breathing it the stars for she looked on them the sun for it warmed her the cold of winter for it chilled her too the breezes of spring for they fanned her pale cheek and cooled her dark brow all had been hers and at the thought that she had passed away a cry of universal mourning broke out from the world she had left behind and darkness descended upon all things as a funeral pall cold and dim the sad ancient city had seen before but it was a thousandfold more melancholy now more black more saturated with the gloom of ages from time to time the wanderer raised his heavy lids scarcely seeing what was before him conscious of nothing but the horror which had so suddenly embraced his whole existence then all at once he was face to face with someone a woman stood still in the way a woman wrapped in rich furs her features covered by a dark veil which could not hide the unequal fire of the unlike eyes so keenly fixed on his have you found her asked the soft voice she is dead answered the wanderer growing very white End of chapter seven chapter eight of the witch of prague a fantastic tale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the witch of prague a fantastic tale by francis marion crawford chapter eight during the short silence which followed, and while the two were still standing opposite to each other, the unhappy man's look did not change. Unorna saw that he was sure of what he said, and a thrill of triumph, as jubilant as his despair was profound, ran through her. If she had cared to reason with herself and to examine into her own sincerity, she would have seen that nothing but genuine passion, good or bad, could have lent the assurance of her rival's death such power to flood the dark street with sunshine. But she was already long past doubt upon that question. The enchanter had bound her heart with his spells at the first glance, and the wild nature was already on fire. For one instant the light shot from her eyes, and then sank again as quickly as it had come. She had other impulses than those of love and subtle gifts of perception that condemned her to know the truth, even when the delusion was most glorious. 
he was himself deceived, and she knew it. Beatrice might, indeed, have died long ago. She could not tell. But as she saw it in the recesses of his mind, she saw that he had no certainty of it. She saw the black presentiment between him and the image, for she could see the image too. She saw the rival she already hated, not receiving a vision of the reality, but perceiving it through his mind, as it had always appeared to him. For one moment she hesitated still, and she knew that her whole life was being weighed in the trembling balance of that hesitation. For one moment her face became an impenetrable mask, her eyes grew dull as uncut jewels, her breathing ceased, her lips were set like cold marble. Then the stony mask took life again, the sight grew keen, and a gentle sigh stirred the chilly air. She is not dead. Not dead, the wanderer started, but fully two seconds after she had spoken, as a man struck by a bullet in battle in whom the suddenness of the shock has destroyed the power of instantaneous sensation. She is not dead. You have dreamed it, said Unorna, looking at him steadily. He pressed his hand to his forehead and then moved it, as though brushing away something that troubled him. Not dead? Not dead? he repeated, in changing tones. Come with me. I will show her to you. He gazed at her and his senses reeled. Her words sounded like rarest music in his ear. In the darkness of his brain a soft light began to diffuse itself. "'Is it possible? Have I been mistaken?' he asked in a low voice, as though speaking to himself. "'Come,' said Unorna again very gently. "'Whither? With you? How can you bring me to her? What power have you to lead the living to the dead?' "'To the living. Come.' "'To the living, yes. I have dreamed an evil dream, a dream of death. She is not. No, I see it now. She is not dead. She is only very far from me, very, very far. And yet it was this morning. But I was mistaken, deceived by some faint likeness. Ah, God, I thought I knew her face. What is it that you want with me? He asked the question as though again suddenly aware of Unorna's presence. She had lifted her veil, and her eyes drew his soul into their mysterious depths. She calls you. Come. She? She is not here. What can you know of her? Why do you look at me so? He felt an unaccountable uneasiness under her gaze, like a warning of danger not far off. The memory of his meeting with her on that same morning was not clear at that moment but he had not forgotten the odd disturbance of his faculties which had distressed him at the time. He was inclined to resist any return of the doubtful state and to oppose Unorna's influence. He felt the fascination of her glance, and he straightened himself rather proudly and coldly, as though to withdraw himself from it. It was certain that Unorna, at the surprise of meeting her, had momentarily dispelled the gloomy presentiment which had given him such terrible pain. And yet, even his disturbed and anxious consciousness found it more than strange that she should thus press him to go with her, and so boldly promise to bring him to the object of his search. He resisted her, and found that resistance was not easy. "'And yet,' said she, dropping her eyes and seeming to abandon the attempt, "'you said that if you failed to-day you would come back to me. Have you succeeded, that you need no help?' I have not succeeded. And if I had not come to you, if I had not met you here, you would have failed for the last time. You would have carried with you the conviction of her death to the moment of your own. It was a horrible delusion, but since it was a delusion it would have passed away in time. With your life, perhaps, who would have waked you if I had not? I was not sleeping. Why do you reason? What would you prove? Much, if I knew how. Will you walk with me? It is very cold." They had been standing where they had met. As she spoke Unorna looked up with an expression wholly unlike the one he had seen a few moments earlier. Her strong will was suddenly veiled by the most gentle and womanly manner, and a little shiver, real or feigned, 
passed over her as she drew the folds of her fur more closely round her. The man before her could resist the aggressive manifestation of her power, but he was far too courteous to refuse her request. "'Which way?' he asked quietly. "'To the river,' she answered. He turned and took his place by her side. For some moments they walked on in silence. It was already almost twilight. "'How short the days are!' exclaimed Unorna, rather suddenly. "'How long, even at their shortest!' replied her companion. "'They might be short, if you would.' He did not answer her, though he glanced quickly at her face. She was looking down at the pavement before her, as though picking her way, for there were patches of ice upon the stones. She seemed very quiet. He could not guess that her heart was beating violently, and that she had found it hard to say six words in a natural tone. So far as he himself was concerned, he was in no humour for talking. He had seen almost everything in the world, and had read or heard almost everything that mankind had to say. The streets of Prague had no novelty for him, and there was no charm in the chance acquaintance of a beautiful woman, to bring words to his lips. Words had long since grown useless in the solitude of a life that was spent searching for one face among the millions that passed before his sight. Courtesy had bidden him to walk with her, because she had asked it, but courtesy did not oblige him to amuse her, he thought, and she had not the power that Keorg Arabian had to force him into conversation, least of all into conversing upon his own inner life. He regretted the few words he had spoken, and would have taken them back, had it been possible. He felt no awkwardness in the long silence. Unorna, for the first time in her life, felt that she had not full control of her faculties. She, who was always so calm, so thoroughly mistress of her own powers, whose judgment Keorg Arabian could deceive, but whose self-possession he could not move, except to anger, was at the present moment both weak and unbalanced. Ten minutes earlier, she had fancied that it would be an easy thing to fix her eyes on his and to cast the veil of a half-sleep over his already half-dreaming senses. She had fancied that it would be enough to say, Come, and that he would follow. She had formed the bold scheme of attaching him to herself, by visions of the woman whom he loved, as she wished to be loved by him. She believed that, if he were once in that state, she could destroy the old love forever, or even turn it to hate at her will. And it had seemed easy. That morning, when he had first come to her, she had fastened her glance upon him more than once, and she had seen him turn a shade paler, had noticed the drooping of his lids and the relaxation of his hands. She had sought him in the street, guided by something surer than instinct, she had found him, had read his thoughts, and had felt him yielding to her fixed determination. Then suddenly her power had left her, and as she walked beside him, she knew that if she looked into his face she would blush and be confused like a shy girl. She almost wished that he would leave her without a word and without an apology. It was not possible, however, to prolong the silence much longer. A vague fear seized her. Had she really lost all her dominating strength in the first moments of the first sincere passion she had ever felt? Was she reduced to weakness by his presence, and unable so much as to sustain a fragmentary conversation, let alone suggesting to his mind the turn it should take? She was ashamed of her poverty of spirit in the emergency. She felt herself tongue-tied, and the hot blood rose to her face. He was not looking at her, but she could not help fancying that he knew her secret embarrassment. She hung her head and drew her veil down so that it should hide even her mouth. But her trouble increased with every moment, for each second made it harder to break the silence. She sought madly for something to say, and she knew that her cheeks were on fire. Anything would do, no matter what. The sound of her own voice, uttering the commonest of commonplaces, would restore her equanimity but that simple, almost meaningless phrase would not be found. She would stammer, if she tried to speak, like a child that has forgotten its lesson and fears the schoolmaster as well as the laughter of its schoolmates. 
It would be so easy if he would say something instead of walking quietly by her side, suiting his pace to hers, shifting his position so that she might step upon the smoothest parts of the ill-paved street, and shielding her, as it were, from the passers-by. There was a courteous forethought for her convenience and safety in every movement of his, a something which a woman always feels when traversing a crowded thoroughfare by the side of a man who is a true gentleman in every detail of life, whether husband or friend or chance acquaintance. For the spirit of the man who is really thoughtful for a woman, as well as sincerely and genuinely respectful in his intercourse with them, is manifest in his smallest outward action. While every step she took increased the violence of the passion which had suddenly swept away her strength, every instant added to her confusion. She was taken out of the world in which she was accustomed to rule, and was suddenly placed in one where men are men and women are women, and in which social conventionalities hold sway. She began to be frightened. The walk must end, and at the end of it they must part. Since she had lost her power over him he might go away, for there would be nothing to bring him to her. She wondered why he would not speak, and her terror increased. She dared not look up, lest she should find him looking at her. Then they emerged from the street and stood by the river, in a lonely place. The heavy ice was grey with old snow in some places, and black in others, where the great blocks had been cut out in long strips. It was lighter here. A lingering ray of sunshine, forgotten by the departing day, gilded the vast walls and turrets of venerable Hradshin, far above them on the opposite bank, and tinted the sharp dark spires of the half-built cathedral which crowns the fortress. The distant ring of fast-moving skates broke the stillness. "'Are you angry with me?' asked Unorna, almost humbly, and hardly knowing what she said. The question had risen to her lips without warning, and was asked almost unconsciously. "'I do not understand. Angry? At what? Why should you think I am angry?' "'You are so silent,' she answered, regaining courage from the mere sound of her own words. "'We have been walking a long time, and you have said nothing. I thought you were displeased.' "'You must forgive me. I am often silent.' "'I thought you were displeased,' she repeated. I think that you were, though you hardly knew it. I should be very sorry if you were angry." "'Why would you be sorry?' asked the wanderer, with a civil indifference that hurt Unorna more than any acknowledgment of his displeasure could have done. "'Because I would help you if you would let me.' He looked at her with sudden keenness. In spite of herself she blushed and turned her head away. He hardly noticed the fact, and, if he had, would assuredly not have put upon it any interpretation approaching to the truth. He supposed that she was flushed with walking. "'No one has ever helped me, least of all in the way you mean,' he said. "'The counsels of wise men, of the wisest, have been useless, as well as the dreams of women who fancy they have the gift of mental sight beyond the limit of bodily vision.' "'Who fancy they see!' exclaimed Unorna almost glad to find that she was still strong enough to feel annoyance at the slight. "'I beg your pardon. I do not mean to doubt your powers, of which I have had no experience. I did not offer to see for you. I did not offer you a dream. Would you show me that which I already see, waking and sleeping? Would you bring to my hearing the sound of a voice which I can hear even now? I need no help for that. I can do more than that, for you." "'And why for me?' he asked, with some curiosity. "'Because—because because you are Keorik Arabian's friend.' She glanced at his face, but he showed no surprise. "'You have seen him this afternoon, of course,' he remarked. An odd smile passed over Unorna's face. "'Yes, I have seen him this afternoon. He is a friend of mine, and of yours. Do you understand?" "'He is the wisest of men,' said the wanderer. "'And also the maddest,' he added thoughtfully. "'And you think it was in his madness, rather than in his wisdom, that he advised you to come to me?' "'Possibly. In his belief in you, at least.' 
and that may be madness? She was gaining courage. Or wisdom, if I am mad. He believes in you, that is certain. He has no beliefs. Have you known him long and do not know that? With him there is nothing between knowledge and ignorance. And he knows, of course, by experience, what you can do and what you cannot do. By very long experience, as I know him. Neither your gifts nor his knowledge of them can change dreams to facts. Unorna smiled again. You can produce a dream, nothing more, continued the wanderer, drawn at last into argument. I too know something of these things. The wisdom of the Egyptians is not wholly lost yet. You may possess some of it, as well as the undeveloped power which could put all their magic within your reach if you knew how to use it. Yet a dream is a dream." "'Philosophers have disputed that,' answered Unorna. "'I am no philosopher, but I can overthrow the results of all their disputations.' "'You can do this. If I resign my will into your keeping, you can cause me to dream. You can call up vividly before me the remembered and unremembered sights of my life. You can make me see clearly the sights impressed upon your own memory. You might do that, and yet you could be showing me nothing which I do not see now before me, of those things which I care to see. But suppose that you were wrong, and that I had no dream to show you but a reality." She spoke the words very earnestly, gazing into his eyes at last without fear. Something in her tone struck him and fixed his attention. "'There is no sleep needed to see realities,' he said. "'I did not say that there was. I only asked you to come with me to the place where she is.' The wanderer started slightly and forgot all the instinct of opposition to her which he had felt so strongly before. "'Do you mean that you know, that you can take me to her?' He could not find words. A strange, overmastering astonishment took possession of him, and with it came wild hope and the wilder longing to reach its realization instantly. "'What else could I have meant? What else did I say?' Her eyes were beginning to glitter in the gathering dusk. The wanderer no longer avoided their look, but he passed his hand over his brow as though dazed. "'I only asked you to come with me,' she repeated softly. There is nothing supernatural about that. When I saw that you did not believe me, I did not try to lead you then, though she is waiting for you. She bade me bring you to her." "'You have seen her? You have talked with her? She sent you? Oh, for God's sake, come quickly! Come, come!' He put out his hand as though to take hers and lead her away. She grasped it eagerly. He had not seen that she had drawn off her glove. He was lost. Her eyes held him, and her fingers touched his bare wrist. His lids drooped, and his will was hers. In the intolerable anxiety of the moment he had forgotten to resist, he had not even thought of resisting. There were great blocks of stone in the desolate place, landed there before the river had frozen for a great building, whose gloomy, unfinished mass stood waiting for the warmth of spring to be completed. She led him by the hand, passive and obedient as a child, to a sheltered spot and made him sit down upon one of the stones. It was growing dark. "'Look at me,' she said, standing before him and touching his brow. He obeyed. "'You are the image in my eyes,' she said, after a moment's pause. "'Yes, I am the image in your eyes,' he answered in a dull voice. "'You will never resist me again. I command it.' Hereafter it will be enough for me to touch your hand or to look at you, and if I say sleep, you will instantly become the image again. Do you understand that?" "'I understand it. Promise.' "'I promise,' he replied, without perceptible effort. "'You have been dreaming for years. From this moment you must forget all your dreams.' His face expressed no understanding of what she said. She hesitated a moment and then began to walk slowly up and down before him. His half-glazed look followed her as she moved. She came back and laid her hand upon his head. "'My will is yours. 
You have no will of your own. You cannot think without me." She spoke in a tone of concentrated determination, and a slight shiver passed over him. "'It is of no use to resist, for you have promised never to resist me again,' she continued. "'All that I command must take place in your mind instantly, without opposition. Do you understand?' "'Yes,' he answered, moving uneasily. For some seconds she again held her open palm upon his head. She seemed to be evoking all her strength for a great effort. "'Listen to me, and let everything I say take possession of your mind for ever. My will is yours. You are the image in my eyes. My word is your law. You know what I please that you should know.' You forget what I command you to forget. You have been mad these many years, and I am curing you. You must forget your madness. You have now forgotten it. I have erased the memory of it with my hand. There is nothing to remember any more." The dull eyes, deep set beneath the shadows of the overhanging brow, seemed to seek her face in the dark, and for the third time there was a nervous twitching of the shoulders and limbs. Unorna knew the symptom well, but had never seen it return so often, like a protest of the body against the enslaving of the intelligence. She was nervous in spite of her success. The immediate results of hypnotic suggestion are not exactly the same in all cases, even in the first moments. Its consequences may be widely different with different individuals. Unorna, indeed, possessed an extraordinary power, but on the other hand, she had to deal with an extraordinary organization. She knew this instinctively, and endeavored to lead the sleeping mind by degrees to the condition in which she wished it to remain. The repeated tremor in the body was the outward sign of a mental resistance which it would not be easy to overcome. The wisest course was to go over the ground already gained. This she was determined to do by means of a sort of catechism. "'Who am I?' she asked. "'Unorna,' answered the powerless man promptly, but with a strange air of relief. "'Are you asleep?' "'No. Awake?' "'No. In what state are you?' "'I am an image.' "'And where is your body?' "'Seated upon that stone.' "'Can you see your face?' "'I see it distinctly. The eyes in the body are glassy. "'The body is gone now. You do not see it any more.' Is that true? It is true. I do not see it. I see the stone on which it was sitting. You are still in my eyes. Now, she touched his head again, now you are no longer an image. You are my mind. Yes, I am your mind. You, my mind, know that I met today a man called the Wanderer, whose body you saw when you were in my eyes. Do you know that or not? I know it. I am your mind. You know, mind, that the man was mad. He had suffered for many years from a delusion. In pursuit of the fixed idea he had wandered far through the world. Do you know whither his travels had led him? I do not know. That is not in your mind. You did not know it when I became your mind. Good. Tell me, mind. What was this man's delusion? He fancied that he loved a woman whom he could not find. The man must be cured. You must know that he was mad and is now sane. You, my mind, must see that it was really a delusion. You see it now. Yes, I see it. Unorna watched the waking sleeper narrowly. It was now night, but the sky had cleared and the starlight falling upon the snow in the lonely open place made it possible to see very well. Unorna seemed as unconscious of the bitter cold as her subject, whose body was in a state past all outward impressions. So far she had gone through all the familiar process of question and answer with success, but this was not all. She knew that if, when he awoke, the name he loved still remained in his memory, the result would not be accomplished. She must produce entire forgetfulness, and to do this she must wipe out every association one by one. 
she gathered her strength during a short pause. She was greatly encouraged by the fact that the acknowledgment of the delusion had been followed by no convulsive reaction in the body. She was on the very verge of a complete triumph, and the concentration of her will during a few moments longer might win the battle. She could not have chosen a spot better suited for her purpose. Within five minutes' walk of streets in which throngs of people were moving about, the scene which surrounded her was desolate and almost wild. The unfinished building loomed like a ruin behind her. The rough-hewn blocks lay like boulders in a stony desert. The broad gray ice lay like a floor of lusterless iron before her under the uncertain starlight. Only afar off, high up in the mighty Hradshin, lamps gleamed here and there from the windows, the distant evidences of human life. All was still. Even the steely ring of the skates had ceased. And so, she continued presently, this man's whole life has been a delusion, ever since he began to fancy in the fever of an illness that he loved a certain woman. Is this clear to you, my mind? It is quite clear, answered the muffled voice. He was so utterly mad that he even gave that woman a name, a name when she had never existed except in his imagination. "'Except in his imagination,' repeated the sleeper, without resistance. "'He called her Beatrice. "'The name was suggested to him because he had fallen ill in a city of the South, "'where a woman called Beatrice once lived, and was loved by a great poet. "'That was the train of self-suggestion in his delirium. "'Mind, do you understand?' "'He suggested to himself the name in his illness.' in the same way that he suggested to himself the existence of the woman whom he afterwards believed he loved? In exactly the same way. It was all a curious and very interesting case of auto-hypnotic suggestion. It made him very mad. He is now cured of it. Do you see that he is cured? The sleeper gave no answer. The stiffened limbs did not move. Indeed, nor did the glazed eyes reflect the starlight. But he gave no answer. The lips did not even attempt to form words. Had Unorna been less carried away by the excitement in her own thoughts, or less absorbed in the fierce concentration of her will upon its massive subject, she would have noticed the silence and would have gone back again over the old ground. As it was, she did not pause. "'You understand, therefore, my mind,' that this Beatrice was entirely the creature of the man's imagination. Beatrice does not exist, because she never existed. Beatrice never had any real being. Do you understand? This time she waited for an answer, but none came. There never was any Beatrice, she repeated firmly, laying her hand upon the unconscious head and bending down to gaze into the sightless eyes. The answer did not come, but a shiver like that of an ague shook the long, graceful limbs. "'You are my mind,' she said fiercely. "'Obey me. There never was any Beatrice. There is no Beatrice now, and there never can be.' The noble brow contracted in a look of agonizing pain, and the whole frame shook like an aspen leaf in the wind. The mouth moved spasmodically. "'Obey me! Say it!' cried Unorna, with passionate energy. The lips twisted themselves, and the face was as grey as the grey snow. "'There is no Beatrice.' The words came out slowly, and yet not distinctly, as though wrung from the heart by torture. Unorna smiled at last, but the smile had not faded from her lips when the air was rent by a terrible cry. "'By the eternal God of heaven!' cried the ringing voice. "'It is a lie! A lie! A lie!' She who had never feared anything earthly or unearthly shrank back. She felt her heavy hair rising bodily upon her head. The wanderer had sprung to his feet. The magnitude and horror of the falsehood spoken had stabbed the slumbering soul to sudden and terrible wakefulness. The outline of his tall figure was distinct against the grey background of ice and snow. 
he was standing at his full height, his arms stretched up to heaven, his face luminously pale, his deep eyes on fire and fixed upon her face, forcing back her dominating will upon itself. But he was not alone. "'Beatrice!' he cried in long-drawn agony. Between him and Unorna something passed by, something dark and soft and noiseless, that took shape slowly. A woman in black, a veil thrown back from her forehead, her white face turned towards the wanderer, her white hands hanging by her side. She stood still, and the face turned, and the eyes met Unorna's, and Unorna knew that it was Beatrice. There she stood, between them, motionless as a statue, impalpable as air, but real as life itself. The vision, if it was a vision, lasted fully a minute. Never, to the day of her death, was Unorna to forget that face, with its death-like purity of outline, with its unspeakable nobility of feature. It vanished as suddenly as it had appeared. A low, broken sound of pain escaped from the wanderer's lips, and with his arms extended he fell forwards. The strong woman caught him, and he sank to the ground gently in her arms, his head supported upon her shoulder as she kneeled under the heavy weight. There was a sound of quick footsteps on the frozen snow. A bohemian watchman, alarmed by the loud cry, was running to the spot. "'What has happened?' he asked, bending down to examine the couple. "'My friend has fainted.' said Unorna calmly. He is subject to it. You must help me to get him home. Is it far? asked the man. To the house of the Black Mother of God. End of chapter 8「9 of the Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 9 The principal room of Keyork Arabian's dwelling was in every way characteristic of the man in the extraordinary confusion which at first disturbed a visitor's judgment some time was needed to discover the architectural bounds of the place the vaulted roof was indeed apparent as well as small portions of the wooden flooring several windows which might have been large had they filled the arched embrasures in which they were set admitted the daylight when there was enough of it in prague to serve the purpose of illumination so far as could be seen from the street they were commonplace windows without shutters and with double casements against the cold but from within it was apparent that the tall arches in the thick walls had been filled in with a thinner masonry in which the modern frames were set so far as it was possible to see the room had but two doors the one masked by a heavy curtain made of a persian carpet opened directly upon the staircase of the house the other exactly opposite gave access to the inner apartments on account of its convenient size however the sage had selected for his principal abiding place this first chamber which was almost large enough to be called a hall and here he had deposited the extraordinary and heterogeneous collection of objects or more properly speaking of remains upon the study of which he spent a great part of his time two large tables three chairs and a divan completed the list of all that could be called furniture the tables were massive dark and old-fashioned the feet at each end consisted of thick flat boards sawn into a design of simple curves and connected by strong cross pieces keyed to them with large wooden bolts 
the chairs were ancient folding-stools with movable backs and well-worn cushions of faded velvet the divan differed in no respect from ordinary oriental divans in appearance and was covered with a stout dark bakara carpet of no great value but so far as its use was concerned the disorderly heaps of books and papers that lay upon it showed that keyork was more inclined to make a bookcase of it than a couch the room received its distinctive character however neither from its vaulted roof nor from the deep embrasures of its windows nor from its scanty furniture but from the peculiar nature of the many curious objects large and small which hid the walls and filled almost all the available space on the floor it was clear that every one of the specimens illustrated some point in the great question of life and death which formed the chief study of keyork arabian's latter years for by far the greater number of the preparations were dead bodies of men of women of children of animals to all of which the old man had endeavoured to impart the appearance of life and in treating some of which he had attained results of a startling nature the osteology of man and beast was indeed represented for a huge case covering one whole wall was filled to the top with a collection of many hundred skulls of all races of mankind and where real specimens were missing their place was supplied by admirable casts of craniums but this raridas so to call it of bony heads formed but a vast grinning background for the bodies which stood and sat and lay in half-raised coffins and sarcophagi before them in every condition produced by various known and lost methods of embalming there were it is true a number of skeletons disposed here and there in fantastic attitudes gleaming white and ghostly in their mechanical nakedness the bones of human beings the bones of giant orang-outangs of creatures large and small down to the flimsy little framework of a common bullfrog strung on wires as fine as hairs which squatted comfortably upon an old book near the edge of a table as though it had just skipped to that point in pursuit of a ghostly fly and was pausing to meditate a farther spring but the eye did not discover these things at the first glance solemn silent strangely expressive lay three slim egyptians raised at an angle as though to give them a chance of surveying their fellow dead the linen bandages unwrapped from their heads and arms and shoulders their jet-black hair combed and arranged and dressed by keyork's hand their faces softened almost to the expression of life by one of his secret processes their stiffened joints so limbered by his art that their arms had taken natural positions again lying over the edges of the sarcophagi in which they had rested motionless and immovable through thirty centuries for the man had pursued his idea in every shape and with every experiment testing as it were the potential imperishability of the animal frame by the degree of life-like plumpness and softness and flexibility which it could be made to take after a mummification of three thousand years and he had reached the conclusion that in the nature of things the human body might vie in resisting the mere action of time with the granite of the pyramids those had been his earliest trials the results of many others filled the room here a group of south americans found dried in the hollow of an ancient tree had been restored almost to the likeness of life and were apparently engaged in a lively dispute over the remains of a meal as cold as themselves and as human there towered the standing body of an african leaning upon a knotted club fierce grinning lacking only sight in the sunken eyes to be terrible 
there again surmounting a lay figure wrapped in rich stuffs smiled the calm and gentle face of a malayan lady decapitated for her sins so marvellously preserved that the soft dark eyes still looked out from beneath the heavy half drooping lids and the full lips still richly coloured parted a little to show the ivory teeth other sights there were more ghastly still triumphs of preservation if not of semi resuscitation over decay won on its own most special ground triumphs all yet almost failures in the eyes of the old student they represented the mad efforts of an almost supernatural skill and superhuman science to revive if but for one second the very smallest function of the living body strange and wild were the trials he had made many and great the sacrifices and blood offerings lavished on his dead in the hope of seeing that one spasm which would show that death might yet be conquered many the engines the machines the artificial hearts the applications of electricity that he had invented many the powerful reactives he had distilled wherewith to excite the long dead nerves or those which but two days had ceased to feel the hidden essence was still undiscovered the meaning of vitality eluded his profoundest study his keenest pursuit the body died and yet the nerves could still be made to act as though alive for the space of a few hours in rare cases for a day with his eyes he had seen a dead man spring half across a room from the effects of a few drops of musk on the first day with his eyes he had seen the dead twist themselves and move and grin under the electric current provided it had not been too late but that too late had baffled him and from his first belief that life might be restored when once gone he had descended to what seemed the simpler proposition of the two to the problem of maintaining life indefinitely so long as its magic essence lingered in the flesh and blood and now he believed that he was very near the truth how terribly near he had yet to learn on that evening when the wanderer fell to the earth before the shadow of beatrice keyork arabian sat alone in his charnel house the brilliant light of two powerful lamps illuminated everything in the place for keyork loved light like all those who are intensely attached to life for its own sake the yellow rays flooded the lifelike faces of his dead companions and streamed upwards to the heterogeneous objects that filled the shelves almost to the spring of the vault objects which all reminded him of the condition of lives long ago extinct endless heaps of barbarous weapons of garments of leather and of fish skin amurian siberian gothic mexican and peruvian african and red indian masks models of boats and canoes sacred drums liberian idols runic calendars fiddles made of human skulls strange and barbaric ornaments all producing together an amazing richness of colour all things in which the man himself had taken but a passing interest the result of his central study life in all its shapes he sat alone the african giant looked down at his dwarf-like form as though in contempt of such half-grown humanity the malayan lady's bodiless head turned its smiling face towards him scores of dead beings seemed to contemplate half in pity half in scorn their would-be reviver keyork arabian was used to their company and to their silence far beyond the common human horror of dead humanity if one of them had all at once nodded to him and spoken to him he would have started with delight and listened with rapture but they were all still dead and they neither spoke or moved a finger a thought that had more hope in it than any which had passed through his brain for many years now occupied and absorbed him a heavy book lay open on the table by his side and from time to time he glanced at a phrase which seemed to attract him it was always the same phrase 
and two words alone sufficed to bring him back to contemplation of it those two words were immortality and soul he began to speak aloud to himself being by nature fond of speech yes the soul is immortal i am quite willing to grant that but it does not in any way follow that it is the source of life or the seat of intelligence the buddhists distinguished it even from the individuality and yet life holds it and when life ends it takes its departure how soon i do not know it is not a condition of life but life is one of its conditions does it leave the body when life is artificially prolonged in a state of unconsciousness by hypnotism for instance is it more closely bound up with animal life or with intelligence if with either has it a definite abiding place in the heart or in the brain since its presence depends directly on life so far as i know it belongs to the body rather than to the brain i once made a rabbit live an hour without its head with a man that experiment would need careful manipulation i would like to try it or is it all a question of that phantom vitality then the presence of the soul depends upon the potential excitability of the nerves and as far as we know it must leave the body not more than twenty-four hours after death and it certainly does not leave the body at the moment of dying but if of the nerves then what is the condition of the soul in the hypnotic state you norna hypnotizes our old friend there and our young one too for her they have nerves at her touch they wake they sleep they move they feel they speak but they have no nerves for me i can cut them with knives burn them turn the life-blood of the one into the arteries of the other they feel nothing if the soul is of the nerves or of the vitality then they have souls for unorna and none for me that is absurd where is that old man's soul he has slept for years has not his soul been somewhere else in the meanwhile if we could keep him asleep for centuries or for scores of centuries like that frog found alive in a rock would his soul able by the hypothesis to pass through rocks or universes stay by him could an ingenious sinner escape damnation for a few thousand years by being hypnotized verily the soul is a very unaccountable thing and what is still more unaccountable is that i believe in it suppose the case of the ingenious sinner suppose that he could not escape by his clever trick then his soul must inevitably taste the condition of the damned while he is asleep but when he is waked at last and found to be alive his soul must come back to him glowing from the eternal flames unpleasant thought keyork arabian you had far better not go to sleep at present since all that is fantastic nonsense on the face of it i am inclined to believe that the presence of the soul is in some way a condition requisite for life rather than depending upon it i wish i could buy a soul it is quite certain that life is not a mere mechanical or chemical process i have gone too far to believe that take man at the very moment of death have everything ready do what you will my artificial heart is a very perfect instrument mechanically speaking and how long does it take to start the artificial circulation through the carotid artery not a hundredth part so long a time as drowned people often lie before being brought back without a pulsation without a breath yet i never succeeded though i have made the artificial heart work on a narcotized rabbit and the rabbit died instantly when i stopped the machine which proves that it was the machine that kept it alive perhaps if one applied it to a man just before death he might live on indefinitely grow fat and flourish so long as the glass heart worked where would his soul be then in the glass heart which would have become the seat of life everything sensible or absurd which i can put into words makes the soul seem an impossibility and yet there is something which i cannot put into words but which proves the soul's existence beyond all doubt i wish i could buy somebody's soul and experiment with it he ceased and sat staring at his specimens going over in his memory the fruitless experiments of a lifetime a loud knocking roused him from his reverie he hastened to open the door and was confronted by unorna 
she was paler than usual and he saw from her expression that there was something wrong what is the matter he asked almost roughly he is in a carriage downstairs she answered quickly something has happened to him i cannot wake him you must take him in to die on my hands not i laughed keyork in his deepest voice my recollection is complete enough she seized him suddenly by both arms and brought her face near to his if you dare to speak of death she grew intensely white with a fear she had not before known in her life keyork laughed again and tried to shake himself free of her grip you seem a little nervous he observed calmly what do you want of me your help man and quickly call your people have him carried upstairs revive him do something to bring him back keyork's voice changed is he in real danger he asked what have you done to him oh i do not know what i have done cried unorna desperately i do not know what i fear she let him go and leaned against the doorway covering her face with her hands keyork stared at her he had never seen her show so much emotion before then he made up his mind he drew her into his room and left her standing and staring at him while he thrust a few objects into his pockets and threw his fur coat over him stay here till i come back he said authoritatively as he went out but you will bring him here she cried suddenly conscious of his going the door had already closed she tried to open it in order to follow him but she could not the lock was of an unusual kind and either intentionally or accidentally keyork had shut her in for a few moments she tried to force the springs shaking the heavy wood work of very little in the great effort she made then seeing that it was useless she walked slowly to the table and sat down in keyork's chair she had been in the place before and she was as free from any unpleasant fear of the dead company as keyork himself to her as to him they were but specimens each having a peculiar interest as a thing but all destitute of that individuality of that grim latent malice of that weird soulless physical power to harm with which timid imaginations endow dead bodies she scarcely gave them a glance and she certainly gave them no thought she sat before the table supporting her head in her hands and trying to think connectedly of what had just happened she knew well enough how the wanderer had lain upon the frozen ground his head supported on her knee while the watchman had gone to call a carriage she remembered how she had summoned all her strength and had helped to lift him in as few women could have done she remembered every detail of the place and everything she had done even to the fact that she had picked up his hat and a stick he had carried and had taken them into the vehicle with her the short drive through the ill-lighted streets was clear to her she could still feel the pressure of his shoulder as he had leaned heavily against her she could see the pale face by the fitful light of the lanterns as they passed and of the lamps that flashed in front of the carriage with each jolting of the wheels over the rough paving stones she remembered exactly what she had done her efforts to wake him at first regular and made with the certainty of success and more and more mad as she realized that something had put him beyond the sphere of her powers for the moment if not for ever his deathly pallor his chilled hands his unnatural stillness she remembered it all as one remembers circumstances in real life a moment after they have taken place but there remained also the recollection of a single moment during which her whole being had been at the mercy of an impression so vivid that it seemed to stand alone divested of any outward sensations by which to measure its duration she who could call up visions in the minds of others who possessed the faculty of closing her bodily eyes in order to see distant places and persons in the state of trance she who expected no surprises in her own act had seen something very vividly which she could not believe had been a reality and which she yet could not account for as a revelation of second sight that dark mysterious presence that had come bodily yet without a body between her and the man she loved was neither a real woman nor the creation of her own brain nor a dream seen in a hypnotic state she had not the least idea how long it had stood there it seemed an hour and it seemed but a second but that incorporeal thing had a life and a power of its own never before had she felt that unearthly chill run through her not that strange sensation in her hair 
it was a thing of evil omen and the presage was already about to be fulfilled the spirit of the dark woman had arisen at the sound of the words in which he denied her she had risen and had come to claim her own to rob unorna of what seemed most worth coveting on earth and she could take him surely to the place whence she came how could unorna tell that he was not already gone that his spirit had not passed already even when she was lifting his weight from the ground at this despairing thought she started and looked up she had almost expected to see that shadow beside her again but there was nothing the lifeless bodies stood motionless in their mimicry of life under the bright light the swarthy negro frowned the face of the malayan woman wore still its calm and gentle expression far in the background the rows of gleaming skulls grinned as though at the memory of their four hundred lives the skeleton of the orangutan stretched out its long bony arms before it the dead savages still squatted round the remains of their meal the stillness was oppressive unorna rose to her feet in sudden anxiety she did not know how long she had been alone she listened anxiously at the door for the sound of footsteps on the stairs but all was silent surely keyork had not taken him elsewhere to his lodgings where he would not be cared for that was impossible she must have heard the sound of the wheels as the carriage drove away she glanced at the windows and saw that the casements were covered with small thick curtains which would muzzle the sound she went to the nearest thrust the curtain aside opened the inner and the second glass and looked out though the street below was dim she could see well enough that the carriage was no longer there it was the bitterest night of the year and the air cut her like a knife but she would not draw back she strained her sight in both directions searching in the gloom for the moving lights of a carriage but she saw nothing at last she shut the window and went back to the door they must be on the stairs or still below perhaps waiting for help to carry him up the cold might kill him in his present state a cold that would kill most things exposed to it furiously she shook the door it was useless she looked about for an instrument to help her strength she could see nothing no yes there was the iron wood club of the black giant she went and took it from his hand the dead thing trembled all over and rocked as though it would fall and wagged its great head at her but she was not afraid she raised the heavy club and struck upon the door upon the lock upon the panels with all her might the terrible blows sent echoes down the staircase but the door did not yield nor the lock either was the door of iron and the lock of granite she asked herself then she heard a strange sudden noise behind her she turned and looked the dead negro had fallen bodily from his pedestal to the floor with a dull heavy thud she did not desist but struck the oaken planks again and again with all her strength then her arms grew numb and she dropped the club it was all in vain keyork had locked her in and had taken the wanderer away she went back to her seat and fell into an attitude of despair the reaction from the great physical effort she had made overcame her it seemed to her that keyork's only reason for taking him away must be that he was dead her head throbbed and her eyes began to burn the great passion had its will of her and stabbed her through and through with such pain as she had never dreamed of the horror of it all was too deep for tears and tears were by nature very far from her eyes at all times she pressed her hands to her breast and rocked herself gently backwards and forwards there was no reason left in her to her there was no reason left in anything if he were gone and if keyork arabian could not cure him who could she knew now what that old prophecy had meant when they had told her that love would come but once and that the chief danger of her life lay in a mistake on that decisive day love had indeed come upon her like a whirlwind he had flashed upon her like the lightning she had tried to grasp him and keep him and he was gone again for ever gone through her own fault through her senseless folly in trying to do by art what love would have done for himself blind insensate mad she cursed herself with unholy curses and her beautiful face was strained and distorted with unconscious fingers she tore at her heavy hair until it fell about her like a curtain in the raging thirst of a great grief for tears that would not flow she beat her bosom she beat her face 
she struck with her white forehead the heavy table before her she grasped her own throat as though she would tear the life out of herself then again her head fell forward and her body swayed regularly to and fro and low words broke fiercely from her trembling lips now and then bitter words of a wild strong language in which it is easier to curse than to bless as the sudden love that had in a few hours taken such complete possession of her was boundless so its consequences were illimitable in a nature strange to fear the fear for another wrought a fearful revolution her anger against herself was as terrible as her fear for him she loved was paralyzing the instinct to act the terror lest it should be too late the impossibility of acting at all so long as she was in prison in the room all three came over her at once the mechanical effort of rocking her body from side to side brought no rest the blow she struck upon her breast in her frenzy she felt no more than the oaken door had felt though she had dealt it with the club she could not find even the soothing antidote of bodily pain for her intense moral suffering again the time passed without her knowing or guessing of its passage driven to desperation she sprang at last from her seat and cried aloud i would give my soul to know that he is safe the words had not died away when a low groan passed as it were round the room the sound was distinctly that of a human voice but it seemed to come from all sides at once unorna stood still and listened who is in this room she asked in loud clear tones not a breath stirred she glanced from one specimen to another as though suspecting that among the dead some living being had taken a disguise but she knew them all there was nothing new to her there she was not afraid her passion returned my soul yes she cried again leaning heavily on the table i would give it if i could know and it would be little enough again that awful sound filled the room and rose now almost to a wail and died away unorna's brow flushed angrily in the direct line of her vision stood the head of the malayan woman its soft embalmed eyes fixed on hers if there are people hidden here cried unorna fiercely let them show themselves let them face me i say it again i would give my immortal soul this time unorna saw as well as heard the groan came and the wail followed it and rose to a shriek that deafened her and she saw how the face of the malayan woman changed she saw it move in the bright lamplight she saw the mouth open horrified she looked away her eyes fell upon the squatting savages their heads were all turned towards her she was sure that she could see their shrunken chests heave as they took breath to utter that terrible cry again and again even the fallen body of the african stirred on the floor not five paces from her would their shrieking never stop all of them every one even to the white skulls high up in the case not one skeleton not one dead body that did not mouth at her and scream and moan and scream again unorna covered her ears with her hands to shut out the hideous unearthly noise she closed her eyes lest she should see those dead things move then came another noise were they descending from their pedestals and cases and marching upon her a heavy-footed company of corpses fearless to the last she dropped her hands and opened her eyes in spite of you all she cried defiantly i will give my soul to have him safe something was close to her she turned and saw keyork arabian at her elbow there was an odd smile on his usually unexpressive face then give me that soul of yours if you please he said he is quite safe and peacefully asleep you must have grown a little nervous while i was away End of chapter nine